Um, so I'm going to um, take us on a little tour around some of the talks that we've been hearing over the last few weeks and using the, uh, the Victorian Engineering Connections Diagram to, to do that. Um, there's a URL down in the bottom corner of this screen if you want to play with this your, yourself afterwards. Um, so I'm just going to drop out of this and I'll make this go full screen if I can. Okay, so um, we're going to start at the Clifton uh, Suspension Bridge Design Competition from 1830. Um, and we're hoping to go around in a, in a big loop and end up back where we started after visiting a, a few of the other talks and, and perhaps a few other interesting things along the way. So um, lots of different people entered this uh, competition and, uh, and we're going to start by going down one of the more as one of the lesser players, you might say, in this, this chap, Joseph Scholes, uh, who was uh, more of an architect, I think, than an engineer. And, and he entered uh, the competition. Uh, I don't think he did very well. And I think I'm right in saying we don't know what his bridge uh, looked like, but I'd be delighted to see it. Um, um, and Scholes, um, he was a great friend of this chap here, Joseph Bonomi the Younger, um, who was a sculptor, artist, and this guy was a very keen uh, Egyptologist. And uh, so um, this links nicely with um, what we heard about all that Egyptian influenced uh, architecture and design, um, which of course we see in the, in the suspension bridge, but also appeared in lots of other places that we heard about. Um, and my particular favorite bit, obviously after the Clifton suspension bridge um, in terms of Egyptian stuff, is this thing here, the, um, the temple works, let's go on to that, uh, the temple works in Leeds. So this was a, a flax mill um, and uh, Bonomi designed the facade of the main sort of office block. And I just want to show you that on PowerPoint because it's really um, quite a remarkable, um, remarkable building. And let's see if we can get this work. So this is, the, um, this is the sort of administration part of the, of the flax mill. And we've got this really quite splendid uh, Egyptian stuff, um, including um, lots and lots of Egyptian detail. This is um, quintessential Egyptian stuff. This is not a great image, um, but it does show the whole of the um, the whole of the factory. So the, the bit we've just been looking at is down here. That's the kind of administration section. But the main the main mill and its ceiling is is there. And it, uh, it's just, I think we can, uh, we, can, we can zoom in on that a bit. And you can see um, this ceiling, uh, this roof, I should say, is covered in these cones, which were uh, skylights. Um, and they provided, not, they provided a certain amount of solar heating in effect, but also light, which is very important. Um, but what was lovely about this um, is that um, the, the ceiling, that the roof was turfed. This was a green roof. Um, which we think of as a modern thing, but this was a green roof, um, which was important because it allowed um, a certain amount of humidity to get through the roof and into the factory itself. And that was important for, for making flax. You needed relatively high humidity so the, the fibers didn't get damaged. And to look after your green roof, they used sheep. So those are sheep that, they were, that were grazing on the roof of the mill to, to keep this turf in, in good condition. They even had to install a, a hydraulic lift uh, to enable um, the sheep to get up and down from the, one, of, one of the first, I think, hydraulic lifts that were out there. Okay, so we'll drop back to the diagram. So um, that's a nice bit of, of Egyptology. Um, and we'll go back to um, uh, Joseph Scholes, who entered the design competition at Clifton. And um, one of his most famous designs, I suppose, was the Yarmouth Suspension Bridge, that um, is um, probably best known for, for its, its failure. Um, so it was, it was opened in 1829, which is interesting from our point of view, because it's being opened just about the same time that the Clifton design competitions are going on. Um, um, but in 1845, it suffered a catastrophic failure. And it did so under quite intriguing circumstances. Um, there was a circus had come to town and this chap here, um, 
put in so you can see him a bit better. This chap was called Nelson the Clown, real name Arthur Nelson, and he had a, uh, a sort of special stunt for a, a, attracting publicity, which was to be towed down a river while sitting in a wash tub, and he was towed by six geese. Actually, the geese weren't really towing him. They had a sort of secret rope connected to a rowing boat that pulled him along. And this, uh, this spectacle attracted a, a large crowd of people, um, and um, the bridge wasn't up to it, and it failed. It had actually, after it had been built, it was lengthened and widened, so that allowed a, a bigger crowd of people to get on. And here we have this rather dramatic picture of the crowd being tipped into the river and something like uh, 79 people died. Most of them, 58 of them, were under the age of 16, so mostly children, which is quite tragic. Um, so that, um, that little disaster um, is quite similar in some ways to another suspension bridge disaster, which happened to um, the South Esk or the Montrose suspension bridge. Um, and this bridge was sorted out afterwards repaired and stiffened by um, James Meadows Rendell, who's got a very busy, very busy um, node on the diagram. And we heard quite a bit about Rendell in the context of the floating bridges, the chain bridges across the Tamar. And of course, he also did one over the River Dart. Um, lots of things we could go with, with uh, Rendell, but we're gonna go to this little node here, which is the Ackerman Morgan Company. And it had a spectacular bankruptcy in 1842. And Rendell was brought in to help deal with the bankruptcy and, um, and be a sort of technical advisor. And um, so the Ackermans, um, um, Daniel Wade Ackerman is the one whose um, who's blue plaque is on, on the side of the Arnolfini building. And, um, one of their companies, or one of the incarnations of their companies, uh, DE and, and A. Ackerman, were the ones that made the in-kind plane and tramway for the Clifton Suspension Bridge. It's over here. Um, and they also made the paddle wheel shaft for the SS Great Western down here, which provides us um, a connection, not in terms just information, but an actual real connection because that paddle wheel shaft um, was connected to the engines of the SS Great Western, and they were made by Maudsley, Sons and Field, um, Henry Maudsley's company. Um, Henry Maudsley's company um, were responsible for the Gampola suspension bridge um, over in um, uh, Ceylon now, Sri Lanka. Um, and that was uh, quite interesting. Well, that was a very interesting uh, insight into some um, background for early suspension bridges. Um, Maudsley Sons, of course, run by Henry Maudsley, the, uh, the great mechanical engineer uh, and uh, the great pioneer of machine making. Uh, lots of people worked with and for him along the way. He became, I mean, his, his works were almost a, a school for, for mechanical engineers. And one of the ones we're going to, we're going to look at one of these, follow one of these, and this is a chap here. Um, Richard Roberts. Um, oh, let me get on his, his note. Um, now, many people have never heard of this guy, um, and yet he really probably deserves a bit more fame. Um, he's been described as the most important British mechanical engineer, or one of the most important mechanical engineers of the um, 19th century. Got up to lots of interesting things. Um, but my particular favorite thing that he got up to was this thing here, a jacquard plate punching machine. So what he did is he took the, the programming part of a jacquard loom. So jacquard looms use punch cards to program the patterns that you were going to see in, in the cloth that was weaved by the loom. And he married that to a plate punching machine that punched holes in iron plates in order to accept rivets. And if you had a project which required a lot of holes, in, and you need to lay them out very precisely. This was just the thing you needed. And of course, the, the reason this was um, so important is that it was used on the three tubular bridges uh, built by Stevenson, um, most notably the Britannia Bridge down here at the bottom that we heard about, 
um, also the uh, the Victoria Bridge in Canada and the um, the uh, Conwy uh, Railway Bridge. Um, Conwy Railway Bridge, um, another tubular bridge of Stevenson's, um, and this, the Conway Railway Bridge is, sits next to um, the Conway Suspension Bridge. And, and we have a little connection here with the Conway Suspension Bridge. Uh, when that was repaired in the early 20th century, the company that did it was a, a very um, experienced um, bridge building, a bridge building contractor. So they didn't design bridges so much as build them, called Alfred Thorne and Sons. They got up to a number of things, but one of them was building the Newport Transporter Bridge. Um, now, Newport Transporter Bridge, um, not the only transporter bridge in this country. Uh, we've got um, three others in the diagram uh, in this country, plus um, one of the early ones in Spain. Um, sadly, the Widnes Runcorn Bridge up here at the top is no longer with us. Um, but the Tees Transporter Bridge, or the Middlestra Transporter Bridge, if you prefer, is with us. Um, and um, if you get a chance, you can pop up and see that um, up at Middlesbrough. Uh, that was built by Arrell and Co. Now, Arrell and Co. Um, built lots and lots of things, but one of them was the Connell Bridge in Scotland. Yeah. In one context, it was co-engineered by Henry Mark Brunel down here at the bottom, who's, um, of course, um, Isambard's um, son. Uh, in partnership with John Wolfe Barry. So um, Henry Mark and John Wolfe Barry formed a very successful partnership, and worked on quite a few things together, um, not just the Connell Bridge. Um, so we're going to follow Wolfe Barry, see where he can take us. Um, again, so he's, he's um, got a, a lot of things under his belt here, um, but we're going to follow a family link from him, if I can find him. Yeah, we're going to go down here. Um, and we're going to see his dad. His dad is Charles Barry, um, English architect. Um, and one of the things that he got up to was designing a rebuild of the uh, Reform Club in London in 1841. Uh, and um, part of the rebuilding of the Reform Club was a revamping of the kitchens. Uh, and these were co-designed with Barry in cooperation with this chap, Alexis Sawyer, uh, up here. Now, Alexis Sawyer was also the head chef at the Reform Club, um, a, a Victorian celebrity chef, really. He cooked for a lot of the great houses in Britain. He also was into um, good works. So he set up soup kitchens for poor people. Uh, he was also a great um, publicitist, self-publicitist. You know, he's written, he wrote a book about himself, at least one, I think maybe more than one, um, a very, in every sense, a larger than life figure, very flamboyant fellow. Um, now Sawyer, um, we also heard about on our talks because um, he collaborated with um, Florence Nightingale and set up soup kitchens or, or army kitchens out in the Crimean War for the British Army. Um, in particular, he also invented this thing called a Sawyer stove, which we'll come back to in a moment. But um, we talked a bit, um, following the Renkioi Hospital talk, we talked a bit about Florence Nightingale. And um, she was a great a statistician, uh, as well as a nurse. And one of the things that she popularized and used quite a lot was the pie chart. Now, the pie chart itself, although she used it a lot, um, wasn't, wasn't actually invented by her. It is usually attributed to this chap here, William Playfair. And um, I've come on this little side visit to William Playfair because he's actually, I think, quite possibly my favourite person in the entire diagram. And if you look at his little bio here, Scottish engineer, political economist, scoundrel, Millwright, engineer, draftsman, accountant, inventor, silversmith, merchant, investment broker, economist, statistician, pamphleteer, translator, publicist, land speculator, convict, banker, royalist, editor, blackmailer, journalist, also a secret agent, 
He was behind a scheme to collapse the French currency by flooding it with um, counterfeiting, which worked. He was also apparently um, present at the storming of the Bastille, joined in. So an amazing man. So uh, well worth um, uh, following that guy up if you want to um, learn about an interesting life. Anyway, we will pop back to Florence Nightingale and um, Alexis Sawyer and the Sawyer Stove. Uh, and the Sawyer Stove was supplied to uh, the Renkioi Hospital uh, for the use by the British Army. Uh, the Sawyer Stove was continued to be used by the British Army for a long time after, right up until the 1980s. And one of the reasons they stopped using it is that they'd put most of their Sawyer Stoves onto the Atlantic conveyor for the, to take down for the Falklands War. And of course, that ship was sunk. So um, most of the British Army's Sawyer stoves are still sitting at the bottom of the Atlantic. And that was really the end of their use in, in the army. But it's remarkable that they lasted that long. So uh, Sawyer stoves used at the Renkioi Hospital, uh, which, we, which we heard about. Um, and we're gonna follow a link from here to the on-site engineer at Renkioi, which is this chap here, uh, John Brunton. Uh, John Brunton was one of the two photographers at Renkioi. Um, uh, and here's um, the, the, the picture we have here is actually one taken by the other photographer, uh, Robertson at, at Renkioi. So if we pop over to Brunton's node, um, and we're going to follow up to, um, he got up to quite a few things, as you can see here, but we are going to go up to um, his, his dad. Uh, if I can find him, here we are. This is his father. Uh, William Brunton Sr. And uh, William Brunton um, got up to quite a few things as well. Um, one of my favorite things he got up to was this, uh, Brunton's mechanical traveler or steam horse. This was an early attempt to build a steam locomotive. And rather than um, driving wheels to push the thing along, the steam engine was hooked up to this very complicated mechanical gubbins that effectively pushed the locomotive along by using these sort of feet and legs arrangement. Uh, it managed three miles an hour. I don't think it uh, didn't catch on. Um, but if we uh, eagle-eyed Clifton Suspension people, uh, Clifton Suspension Bridge people may spot that on this diagram, we have a very familiar name. One of the people that was trained by Brunton was this chap here, uh, William Hawkes, Iron Master from Birmingham very much associated with the, uh, the Eagle Foundry. And of course, William Hawkes was the guy that designed the uh, entry for the Clifton Suspension Bridge competitions in both 1829 and 30, and very, very nearly won, if it hadn't been for the perhaps intervention of, of, um, of, uh, Francis, uh, of Davis Gilbert. And that brings us back to where we started, the 1830 uh, Clifton suspension bridge design competition. So I think having arrived back where we started, it's probably a good point to, uh, to stop. <laughs>